This slide deck will cover energy transfer. Primarily, we are interested in where energy comes from, how we generate energy in the form of ATP. So specifically, uh, your objective will be to identify ATP production from the phosphagen system, from glycolysis, where we convert glucose to pyruvate or glucose to lactate, then we want to talk about the Krebs cycle where we convert acetyl-CoA into electron transport carriers, NADH and FADH2, as well as making ATP. To start, I just want to remind you, we spoke about fuel utilization from fats and carbohydrates in the first slide deck. One of the ways we can determine fuel utilization or where energy production is coming from is by looking at a respiratory exchange ratio. So this essentially is the amount of carbon dioxide you're producing divided by the amount of oxygen you're consuming. Now we talked earlier about how at high intensity exercise you could imagine you're producing high amounts of carbon dioxide. So your CO2 value in the numerator is going to be quite large relative even to large amounts of oxygen consumption. And this will raise your RER to a value greater than 1. At a value greater than 1, you're predominantly using carbohydrates as a fuel source. Whereas typically at rest, when you break down a fatty acid molecule, the amount of CO2 produced relative to the oxygen consumed approximately gives you a ratio of 0.7, which predominantly means your energy is coming from fat. It's also important to note, because this will be important later on, is that the energy you are able to generate in kilocalories for every liter of oxygen consumed is much smaller than the amount of energy you can uh, from the energy that can be utilized per liter of oxygen consumed from carbohydrate. So you can imagine now the importance of carbohydrate as a fuel source at higher intensities because it is able to allow you to use greater energy than what you would receive from purely oxidizing fats as a fuel source. This will be even more interesting in a week or so when we perform a VO2 max lab and we can directly measure CO2 production and oxygen consumption. So we'll be able to actually see in the lab later on in this course what is happening as we increase exercise intensity. So we know that adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, is our energy currency. And we want to discuss mechanisms by which we replenish ATP. Recall from anatomy and physiology that myosin crossbridge head and skeletal muscle is the site where the ATPase enzyme exists to cleave phosphate bonds to generate the ability to do work and contract skeletal muscle. So if you were to look locally at cross bridge heads in skeletal muscle, you would find that ATP levels would decrease locally to that area of contraction. It's rare that we see massive drops in ATP currency even during exercise, primarily because we have so many pathways and mechanisms to replenish ATP. So it's thought that if ATP levels do decrease during extreme exercise conditions, it may simply only be localized to those areas of activity within the skeletal muscle fibers. Again, just recall here that the ATPase enzyme is what's cleaving phosphate bonds. So an adenosine molecule and three phosphate molecules attached are what we, what we would call ATP. And once we cleave off that bond, we synthesize 
an ADP molecule and an inorganic phosphate molecule. Also important to understand the phosphagen system. Okay. The phosphagen system involves basically taking a phosphate molecule from phosphocreatine and placing that phosphate molecule on an ADP molecule, producing ATP and creatine as a byproduct. One of the things that's Im important to understand about our energy systems is their power versus capacity. So I like to think of sort of the ATP and phosphagen system as having a high power but low capacity. So what that means is the phosphagen system can synthesize ATP at a very high rate. Since power is defined by the energy you produce over time, the phosphagen system can produce lots of ATP in a very short period of time. But its capacity is low because it cannot produce large amounts of ATP relative to the other systems. So if we just look at sort of the opposite extreme example of the aerobic energy systems, things like beta oxidation, or the Krebs cycle, where we produce ATP through breaking down carbohydrates or fats, you'll find that the rate of ATP production is quite low in beta oxidation or the Krebs cycle, whereas the amount of ATP that you can synthesize in total from the aerobic systems is quite large. So just keep that relationship in the back of your mind as we go through the rest of the slides here. Here's an example of just looking at high intensity activity and the changes in ATP and phosphocreatine. So you can see almost instantaneously within the first two seconds, as soon as you start that sprint, phosphagen levels are immediately dropping to help synthesize ATP and continue to maintain that energy need during the sprint. So ultimately what you're seeing here is that with high intensity sprinting exercise, phosphagen levels, excuse me, phosphocreatine specifically, PCR is dropping to help maintain this ATP demand. It's just another example of the ATPase reaction as well as the creatine kinase or creatine phosphokinase reaction. So you should be aware of these pathways and you should be aware of the enzymes responsible for these ATP and phosphagen system energy pathways. Some other terms we just want to point out are oxidation and reduction reactions. One of the things that's important is when we discuss oxidative phosphorylation, it involves the movement of electrons or hydrogen atoms. So when we oxidize a molecule, I always remember the acronym OIL, oxidize or oxidation is lost. So when we oxidize NADH to NAD+, we're losing electrons, so it is being oxidized. If we reduce a molecule, if we reduce NAD+, the acronym is oil rig. So reduction is gained, so NAD plus gains an electron and forms NADH. Another key term, just phosphorylation, if we add a phosphate to a molecule. So substrate level phosphorylation would involve taking a substrate like glucose and phosphorylating it or adding a phosphate molecule. So one of the first steps in glycolysis is the synthesis of glucose 6 phosphate. So the first step in the reaction is to convert glucose to glucose 6 phosphate by adding a phosphate molecule. And oxidative phosphorylation involves where we see uh, phosphorylating uh, molecule additions along the electron transport chain as we shuttle electrons around to synthesize ATP and phosphorylate ADP.
So in terms of looking inside the cell in cellular respiration, oxidation and reduction reactions are the mechanism that underlies essentially synthesizing ATP. So oxidative phosphorylation, recall, occurs in the mitochondria. So you're removing electrons from hydrogen atoms, passing them onto oxygen atoms, and performing these redox reactions, which essentially are oxidation reduction reactions. That allows us to generate energy to synthesize ATP and phosphorylate ADP molecules. So here's a reaction for oxidizing NADH at the bottom of your screen here. For every molecule of NADH that you can oxidize in the mitochondria, you synthesize 2.5 ATP. If you look at FADH2, for every molecule of FADH2 that you oxidize, you synthesize 1.5 ATP. So really what's, what's important to understand here for the purposes of this class is when we look at glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, we're going to point out where electron carriers are synthesized. So these electron carriers are then synthesized and shuttled to the mitochondria where they are then coupled with redox reactions to make ATP. And here is just simply a figure from the McCarl textbook that's showing you the outer and inner membranes of the mitochondria. And the membranes are important because you're essentially creating a gradient of hydrogen protons. And this gradient provides energy for coupling the shuttling of electrons to the phosphorylation of ADP molecules to make ATP. Two point. So now if you just sort of take a look at this figure from the McArdle text, this is a nice review of where these energy pathways are happening and what fuel sources are being used. So if we start with looking inside the cytosol where glycolysis occurs, we also have phosphocreatine for the phosphogen system and glucose and glycogen. So the, the important thing here is glycolysis occurs inside the cytosol of the cell. In the mitochondria, that's where we have the citric acid cycle as well as oxidative phosphorylation. And our fuel sources for the citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation are fatty acids, pyruvate that we make from glycolysis, and even some amino acids. Whereas in the cytosol, we're essentially using glucose and glycogen uh, as well as glycerol as a fuel source. Here's sort of another big picture. You're going to want to come back and, and look this over after we talk through the citric acid cycle and glycolysis. But you can just see starting in the liver where we store glucose, as we mentioned earlier, we can shuttle that glucose into the bloodstream where it can be then taken up into the cells and glucose can be converted to pyruvate for the citric acid cycle. There's our electron transport chain to oxidize those electron carriers that we've mentioned. We can look at adipose tissue and free fatty acid production. That gets shuttled into the bloodstream and taken up into skeletal muscle. And then directly inside skeletal muscle itself, we've got intramuscular stores of ATP, phosphocreatine, fats or triacylglycerols, as well as glycogen. So definitely come back to this after we've talked about glycolysis and the citric acid cycle to sort of just get a big picture of where energy is coming from. Before we do jump into glycolysis and Krebs cycle, it's important to just briefly touch on the idea that as exercise time increases, then the longer the exercise bout, the red line is aerobic exercise and the blue line is symbolizing anaerobic. I'm not a big fan of the idea of aerobic versus anaerobic, meaning with o without oxygen and with oxygen 
because even in high intensity events you're still engaging your respiratory system with gas exchange but if we were to separate out the energy pathways as aerobic and anaerobic recall your anaerobic systems are going to be things like your essentially your phosphagen system PCR and ATP as well as anaerobic glycolysis whereas your aerobic systems would be aerobic glycolysis the citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation this is a common graph that you'll see if we look at exercise length on the x-axis and then the basically the each energy systems potential to contribute Look at the first solid black line, which is your immediate ATP and phosphagen system. So essentially this graph is saying within the first 30 seconds, the potential for a 30 second all out bout, you're predominantly getting contributions from your ATP and phosphagen system to propel the activity or the ATP demand for that exercise. The non-oxidative systems next that I'll color in blue this is where we're thinking primarily anaerobic glycolysis, which really is the conversion of glucose to lactate. And we'll talk more about that shortly. But you can see this system is essentially ramping up initially within the first 10 to 20 seconds, reaching a peak and then diminishing its contribution over the next 3 to 5 minutes. Your aerobic or oxidative system that I'll put in green, you can see it takes a minute or two to ramp up its contribution. So this would be through your Krebs cycle, your beta oxidation, uh, your oxidative phosphorylation energy pathways. The thing that I want to point out to you that I think is important is if you think of these three systems in your body operating not independently but with dials so that essentially what's happening is during exercise, depending on the intensity, you can turn these dials up or down. So rather than think of these systems as functioning all by themselves, so if, it, if it's a 10 second event, then the only system you will ever have active is the phosphagen system, I think a better way to, to grasp this concept is the dial for the immediate energy systems is ramped up quite high in a short 10 second bout. And the oxidative and non-oxidative systems aren't necessarily turned off. They're just dialed back. And here's just an example of looking at different duration events and classifying what the activity may be, what enzymes are responsible, and what the fuel source is going to be. So I really only just leave this here for you to consider and we will discuss more of this in class. This is a very nice big picture of where our energy is coming from. That would be important for you to sort of look back and review. I'll just briefly point out here, notice if we look at sort of the link in carbohydrates and fats, carbohydrates get broken down into glucose, we can actually convert glycerol to glucose from fatty acid or from a triglyceride. Fatty acids take a separate pathway into the Krebs cycle via acetyl-CoA. Glucose gets converted to acetyl-CoA with pyruvate as the intermediate. And if I just move down here a little bit now, so sort of the common linkage would be acetyl-CoA, which enters the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. Throughout glycolysis and the citric acid cycle, we're producing electron carriers that can be oxidized through oxidative phosphorylation to make more energy. And so this is just a really nice sort of summary of where energy is coming from. And you're going to want to come back and look at this slide again once we've uh, sort of finalized 
glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. The next couple of slides I'm going to move through rather quickly are just different versions of glycolysis. Generally speaking, I do not expect you to memorize glycolysis. What I expect you to understand is that in the beginning of glycolysis, there's an investment of phosphorylation where you have to pay into ATP. And the benefit is you're essentially going from glucose at the start and on the right side here in the pink box you're producing two molecules of G3P. So you get two molecules of G3P which means what you produce in this box is doubled. So you produce two electron carriers, NADH. You produce two ATP uh, at, at two points in the pathway. So ultimately you produce four ATP, but you use two to invest in the system, meaning your net ATP production in glycolysis, converting glucose to pyruvate, is two ATP, along with two molecules of NADH. Here's just another way of looking at it. I think I took this picture from the Khan Academy. And then just once more, again, this is the overall view of glycolysis. Things I would point out to you here, again, recall, you do not need to have memorized glycolysis. What you should understand, however, is the rate-limiting enzyme for glycolysis is PFK, or phosphofructokinase. Again, notice the investment of 2 ATP, and then ultimately you get out 4 ATP. And you also produce two electron carriers in NADH. Now, if you were to start with glycogen instead of glucose, you skip the first step in glycolysis because glycogen is immediately converted to G6P. So you avoid investing one energy. So when you have glycogen as a fuel source, which is located immediately within your muscle cells, you can save an ATP, and starting with glycogen results in a net gain of 3 ATP instead of 2. So now we should sort of differentiate why we convert pyruvate to lactate. We convert pyruvate to lactate when we are looking to ramp up glycolysis through the anaerobic glycolytic pathway to make more ATP. So this graph is essentially showing you as the level of exercise intensity increases, the higher amounts of blood lactate you produce. Over here, this is just a, a recovery curve showing that lactate, blood lactate level is reduced through essentially recovery or rest. So you should be aware of the Cori cycle. And the Cori cycle essentially is how we deal with lactate. So inside the active muscle cell, you're converting glucose to pyruvate to lactate, and that lactate is then being shuttled into your circulatory system that lactate is then shuttled back to the liver where it is then converted to pyruvate and back to glucose so that it can be secreted back into your bloodstream as use for fuel. It's important to understand that lactate does not cause fatigue. Lactate is simply a marker for exercise and it sort of gets a bad rap because it just happens to be a very easily measurable marker that you would measure with a finger prick and a lactate meter to, to simply plot out and estimate intensity of the exercise. You're making lactate right now. The challenge is when we ex examine lactate, we're interested in lactate production 
versus lactate clearance or removal. So you're always making and clearing lactate through the quarry cycle. But the question is, as exercise intensity ramps up, then the lactate amount that you produce increases. So when you look at glycolysis and the breakdown of glucose to pyruvate, that only releases a small amount of ATP. So the remaining ATP production from glycolysis comes when you convert pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. So the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA also results in the synthesis of an electron carrier, NADH. So remember, you make two pyruvate for every molecule of glucose that undergoes glycolysis, which means you get two acetyl-CoA molecules and two NADH molecules. This will become important when we diagram the total energy production from one molecule of glucose being oxidized. Here's a nice overview of aerobic glycolysis. So we start with glucose to pyruvate. Pyruvate is converted to acetyl-CoA, and acetyl-CoA then enters the citric acid cycle. Upon entering the citric acid cycle, one molecule of acetyl-CoA gives you 3 NADH, 1 FADH2, and 1 ATP. But remember, we're producing 2 acetyl-CoA, so we double this. So everything gets multiplied by 2. So now, in glycolysis, pyruvate produces acetyl-CoA, and the acetyl-CoA molecule can then synthesize 6 NADH, 2 FADH2, and 2 ATP. This is just an, uh, a better way to look at it. You don't need to memorize the entire citric acid cycle for the purposes of this class, but know that one acetyl-CoA produces one 2, 3 NADH, 1 FADH2, and 1 ATP. Okay. Remember that for every molecule of NADH that you oxidize, you get 2.5 ATP, whereas for every molecule of FADH2, you get 1.5 ATP. Okay. So we're going to multiply those out in a minute and sort of diagram how much ATP we're getting from one molecule of glucose after it's completely oxidized to water and CO2. Okay, this slide or picture from your text is a really nice overview of where all the energy is coming from when you oxidize one molecule of glucose. So glucose to pyruvate gives us 2 ATP. It gives us, converting glucose to pyruvate, we get 2 NADH. So that's all just from glucose to pyruvate. From pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, we have 2 pyruvate, so we get 2 NADH. And then, from acetyl-CoA, since there's two acetyl-CoA, I'm just going to multiply everything by two, just like the picture shows. So we get 6 NADH, 2 FADH2, and 2 ATP. So you might want to pause the video here, go back and look and see where these ATP are coming from, and now we're going to see what happens when we multiply the electron carriers by their respective ATP yields and see if we get the magic number of 32. So if I zoom in down here, what you're seeing is substrate phosphorylation through glycolysis is the production of just pure ATP, phosphorylating glucose and synthesizing ATP molecules.
So you get 2 ATP there. Glucose to pyruvate gives you 2 NADH. 2 NADH times 2.5 molecules of ATP per NADH is 5 ATP. When you convert pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, you get 2 NADH again. So 2 NADH times 2.5 is another 5 ATP. In the citric acid cycle, substrate phosphorylation, we phosphorylate uh, GDP molecule. We get straight up 2 ATP from that. And then in the citric acid cycle, we produce 6 NADH. So 6 times 2.5 is 15. And then we also get uh, 2 molecules of FADH2. And when you multiply 2 times 1.5, you get 3 ATP for a total of 32. So if you go back, look at this, be able to diagram and explain where all the energy is coming from when you convert glucose to CO2 and water. So see if you can track through where that 32 ATP are coming from. And remember, you need to recall that there's 2.5 ATP per NADH and 1.5 ATP per FADH2. Good luck. The only other thing I want to mention is if I were to draw a line through the cell right here, this is all occurring in the cytosol, and pyruvate gets shuttled uh, into the mitochondria as acetyl-CoA. This is just a great sort of summary view, again, of electron carrier production, right? and then the shuttling to the electron transport chain through oxidative phosphorylation. We're going to sort of just conclude with fat metabolism and beta oxidation, so where energy comes from when you're looking at fat. Recall a triglyceride is a glycerol molecule and three free fatty acids. The enzyme responsible for this is uh, HSL, or hormone-sensitive lipase. Okay. I just want to remind you briefly, we're not going to go in depth on beta oxidation, but what you should be aware of and what's important when you think of fuel utilization during exercise is that carbohydrates are stored within the muscle as glycogen. Fats are also stored within the muscle. It's called intramuscular triglyceride, IMTGs. So those are free fatty acids that you have stored directly, or excuse me, triglycerides that you store directly within the muscle. But we know we also store fat in adipose tissue. Now when you look at the transport and uptake of free fatty acids from adipose tissue, just very briefly, albumin is a protein that binds and transports these free fatty acids through your blood. So you've got to release the free fatty acid from your adipose tissue into the blood, and then you've got to take it up into the skeletal muscle. And what's interesting, as you increase exercise intensity, what's going to happen is you're going to drive more blood flow to skeletal muscle and less blood flow to adipose tissue, which is going to limit the release of free fatty acids from adipose tissue and limit its use as a fuel source. I just want to point out that glycerol is converted to an intermediate in the glycolytic pathway, so you can convert glycerol to glucose, and free fatty acids are essentially transformed into acetyl-CoA during beta oxidation. So recall in the beginning of this lecture when we were talking about the rate or power capacity of the energy systems versus its entire capacity to synthesize ATP. So considering that acetyl-CoA is a two-carbon molecule, while free fatty acids are just strands of carbon molecules. So if you look at glucose, which has six carbons, compared to a free fatty acid, which could have 18, 26, 30 carbon molecules, and then when you look at a tr uh, triglyceride, a triglyceride is a glycerol molecule 
plus three fatty acids. So now you're essentially looking at multiple carbon chains. So if I can cleave two carbons off of every fatty acid, then I'm going to have a lot of acetyl-CoA that I can produce in beta oxidation to make ATP. So here's sort of the link between why adipose tissue is so energy dense, because those free fatty acids are just long chains of carbon molecules that we can cleave into two carbon acetyl-CoAs to make energy through the Krebs cycle. So we sort of just kind of come back to the big picture now. Here we're specifically looking at free fatty acids. So remember, you've got to use hormone-sensitive lipase to cleave into three fatty acids and a glycerol molecule. The glycerol molecule can be transported inside skeletal muscle and converted to glucose. We've also got to take the fatty acid, bind it to albumin, transport it into skeletal muscle to undergo, essentially, shuttling into the mitochondria to acetyl-CoA in the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain for oxidative phosphorylation. So while this is really showing the amount of ATP you produce from beta oxidation, it's a nice link as well, or a good overview to show you how fatty acids are shuttled into skeletal muscle. They undergo beta oxidation where they ultimately produce acetyl-CoA for the Krebs cycle. So that's our main, main concern here. Uh, that fatty acids are oxidized via beta oxidation to produce acetyl-CoA, which enters the Krebs cycle. So this sort of concludes the energy systems. Um, to sort of just wrap up and give you some things to think about before we uh, meet for the first class period, where's the ATP coming from when I convert glucose to CO2? and water. How do free fatty acids play a role in terms of linking up with acetyl-CoA and the Krebs cycle? And then start thinking about the time or duration of an activity and how these energy systems are related to the intensity of physical activity. And I look forward to seeing you guys on Wednesday, July 5th. Thanks.